You are here today for the third Wonka Young Doctors Movement webinar series, the third one, the lifestyle medicine, a leap towards a healthy life. Uh, I'm really happy to see you all today. Uh, we have our four eminent speakers, our colleagues uh, with us. Uh, as uh, the chair of the Spice Road Movement, I would like to welcome you all. Uh, this webinar, even though it's a collective uh, effort of the YDM, was mainly organized by the Spice Root, uh, YDM South Asia, and the Afrivon, YDM, Ivanka YDM uh, Africa. So my colleague, brother Kome, will co-chair with me uh, the whole session today. And uh, I would like to do the formal welcome. First and foremost, I would like to welcome all four speakers, Ore from Nigeria, Abdul from Malaysia, Hela from Saudi Arabia, and Marina from Bosnia. And we have two translators, again, our colleagues, uh, Loretta and Brando. In addition, I would like to warmly welcome all our YDM leads from all seven regions who have, who have joined us today. And with that, I would like to welcome you, the participants, our dear colleagues, to this third YDM webinar, The Lifestyle Medicine, A Leap Towards a Healthy Life. Right. Dear friends, I'm going to tell you a story first, just before. This is from the New York Times, uh, 2012, 24th October. Uh, this is all about a Greek veteran named Stamatis Moraitis, who came to America. Actually, he migrated to States just to get treatment. And later on, he settled there. And this is... The story uh, is about one day in 1976. Let me quote the New York Times Magazine. One day in 1976, Moritis felt short of breath. Climbing stairs was a call. He had to quite, he has, he has, he had to quit working midday after X-rays. His doctor concluded that Moritis had lung cancer. As he recalls, nine other doctors confirmed the same diagnosis and they gave him nine months to live. Now, what do you think and what do you uh, think uh, Moritis would have done? He would have actually uh, stayed there with his loud ones, but he decided instead to return to a career where he could be buried with his ancestors in a cemetery shaded by oak trees that overlook the Aegean Sea. This guy originally is from this Greek island, a career, and he wanted to go back there. And he went there. And what do you think happened to him? Friends, this is, this is uh, Moritis after many decades at age of 100 plus, tending his vineyard and olive grove on Icaria. So this, uh, with this, the reporter wanted to know what happened to him? How does he think that he recovered from lung cancer? And uh, what would have been the answer? Moritis told, 
it just went away. I actually went back to America about 25 years after moving here to see if the doctors could explain it to me. So what did the doctors tell? He told, my doctors were all dead. My doctors were all dead. Friends, uh, researchers found some other places also, just like a carrier. And they are called blue zones. You can see the blue zones in this picture. Fortunately, the blue zones are scattered all over the world. I think all of these places represent all our uh, uh, continents, even our YDM uh, regions as well. So what are the things, what are the common factors that would have been uh, there in this area, the blue zones? Our talks today are about that. I'm not going to tell you what are these important factors. The secrets of longevity of life in these blue zones. To tell that, we have four eminent speakers. First, it would be Ore, Dr. Ore Makinde is a consultant family physician and also IBLM, that is International Board of Lifestyle Medicine Certified Lifestyle Medicine Physician from Nigeria. And he's also, she's also the secretary of everyone. Over to you, Ari. Thank you very much, Sankha. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I'm going to be talking to us about um, the basics in lifestyle medicine, as well as healthy eating. This is very important for us to understand how we can take a leap towards a healthy lifestyle and um, a, a long life, what we call longevity, as seen in um, the person that was just shared by Sanka. So if you will please move on to the next slide. Okay, so these are our objectives. We want to um, share the definitions of lifestyle medicine. We also want to say a little bit about the history of lifestyle medicine. We want to um, share with us what makes lifestyle medicine a distinct specialty um, and compare it to some of the specialties we're already used to. And we'll also elaborate on the scientific basis for healthy eating. Next slide. I have three definitions that I want us to take a look at. Um, there is one by the 2018 Lifestyle Medicine Core Competencies, which is a curriculum set up by the American College of Lifestyle Physicians. And it says that lifestyle medicine offers a unique approach, leverages a whole food plant-based diet, physical activity, sleep, emotional well-being, as well as avoiding risky stuff substances to prevent, to treat, and to reverse lifestyle related diseases. This definition is similar to what is found in a lifestyle medicine textbook by Professor Gary Egger, who is an adjunct professor of lifestyle medicine. He has written over 30 books and published over 1000 um, um, papers in this respect. He says it's the application of medical, behavioral, motivational and environmental principles in order to manage lifestyle health related problems in a clinical setting. The last definition I'd like to share with us um, was given by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and was updated in 2021. And it talks about lifestyle medicine being the evidence-based 
lifestyle therapeutic intervention, um, taking into cognizance everything that I mentioned before, whole food, plant predominant eating pattern, regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, as well as positive social connections as a primary modality. And this uh, modality is delivered by clinicians who are trained and certified in the specialty. One of the things that makes lifestyle medicine very distinct is the fact that it is a primary modality. It's a subspecialty for every specialty, but it is primary. That means that is the first line of care for whoever is, it's being prescribed. And these are the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And we're going to be talking about each of these, not all of them really, but we're going to be talking about um, four of them today. Going on to the next slide, let's um, share a bit about the history of lifestyle medicine. If you remember Hippocrates and your Hippocratic oath, there is something that Hippocrates said. He said, I will remember that there is an art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. So lifestyle medicine is distinct in the fact that it goes beyond surgery, it goes beyond um, the medication that we give our patients. And Hippocrates is often quoted as saying that, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. And that's why I'm also going to be talking about healthy eating. We have some other pioneers um, in lifestyle medicine. Please move on to the next slide. Thomas Edison, this is a quote that says that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his or her patients in the care of the human frame in a proper diet and in the course and prevention of disease. So this is one of the leaps that we're taking as the doctors of the future. Next slide. These are some of the pioneers of lifestyle medicine. So it's interesting to note that lifestyle medicine has been around with us since as far back as 1970s. And um, there was this center known as the Nathan Pritikin Longevity Center in which um, people were housed in a residential center that used nutrition, exercise and education to treat and as well um, reverse lifestyle related diseases. Um, a similar program was developed by John McDougall also in the 1970s, where he also added stress reduction as one of the things to um, treat and reverse um, diseases that are lifestyle related. We have Dean Onish, he started the lifestyle heart trial um, within a, pre a preventive uh, medicine research center also established in 1980. And it was interesting to know that the work that he did showed that there was a regression of cardiac stenosis at one year in those people who were placed on um, this therapeutic intervention that involved the pillars that I mentioned earlier. Similar um, trials and um, programs have been implemented by Cadwell B. Essington, um, um, Hans DL, that's the Coronary Health Improvement Project, now known as the Complete Health Improvement Project, and has been instituted in several offices and um, corporates, as well as hospitals um, worldwide. We have um, the inaugural report by um, the World Health Organization. This inaugural report was on diets, nutrition, and prevention of chronic disease in 1990. We also have John Kelly, who was a pioneer and um, founder of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And we have the um, ABLM that was set up in 2015. That's the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And a year after, the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine was set up to conduct exams so that we'll have um, certified and competent people who are trained to deliver the arts and the science of lifestyle medicine. Next slide, please. So this shows the distinction in lifestyle medicine. Um, the emphasis is on behavioral change because the body can repair itself. And I think that's what happened in the life of that man who turned 100 
years, even after all his doctors had died, because he uh, embarked on lifestyle changes that allow the body repair itself. And the focus is on evidence-based optimal nutrition, stress management, and fitness prescriptions. Patients are active partners in their care. They have to take responsibility for whatever changes they're making in their lifestyle. And another good thing about lifestyle medicine is that it treats the cause of disease. Um, many times we, we give a pill for every ill, but we don't look at what the root cause of that disease is. This is what lifestyle medicine looks at. And we're able to educate, guide, and support patients to make those um, behavioral changes. Medications are not excluded, but this time round, they're used as an adjunct to the therapeutic lifestyle changes. And the patient's home, as well as, as his um, community environment, are assessed as contributing factors. Next slide, please. This is different from, from conventional medicine, where um, the highest level of care has to do with surgery or um, pharmaceuticals, and the patient is a passive recipient of care. It focuses on the symptoms and the signs of the disease and not the underlying lifestyle causes. The patient is not expected to make behavioral changes like you see in lifestyle medicine. And we, the biomedical model is a usual model of approach and by the physician. And like I mentioned, medication are the primary therapeutic intervention. And usually the parents home, patients home and community are not typically considered. Next slide. So just to um, emphasize that lifestyle medicine is different from integrative medicine, is different from functional medicine, um, because so th there might be some confusion. And um, even though some of these practices are evidence-based and might be made use of in lifestyle medicine, they are not exactly lifestyle medicine. So um, integrative medicine, for example, um, there is a focus on acupuncture, biofeedback, nutraceuticals, as well as some lifestyle interventions, which are evidence-based. In functional medicine, um, it, the emphasis is on, a, on the evidence-based systems biology approach that addresses underlying physiological and biologic dysfunction. So here, testing is very important. You want to know the levels of the hormones and the metabolites. Um, and then you now make use of pharmaceuticals, biologicals, and neuroceuticals to take care of um, that dysfunction. Next slide. It's different from mind-body medicine. Um, this talks about interactions between the mind, the body, um, in terms of behavior, emotion, and um, mentally, um, socially, and spiritually. Now, these modalities include yoga, hypnosis, visual imagery, biofeedback, tai chi, and some of these are evidence-based and used in lifestyle medicine, but it's still not exactly lifestyle medicine. And preventive medicine, which oversees the the field of public health is also different. You're looking at interventions such as immunization, screening, protection from bioterrorism, but it's still different from lifestyle medicine. Next slide. So what exactly is healthy eating? Because that's what I'm going to be putting some emphasis on today. And um, next slide. When you see this, what comes to your mind? We have a photo there. You have um, all sorts of sweets. You have fries. You have um, burgers. Um, we have cakes. Some of us um, take these things day in, day out. You know, they are fast food. And uh, I've heard someone say that when you take fast food, that leads to fast death. And that's one of the steps we need to um, take. We need to change that mindset so that we can adopt um, primarily healthy food um, as one of the pillars in lifestyle medicine is healthy eating. So we see this other diagram, you have almonds, um, you have peas, you have broccoli, you have um, legumes and all, carrots, and much more than this. Next slide. A lot of times I ask my patients which one they would choose between um, a bottle of Coca-Cola and a bottle of water. And I always like telling them that, well, I've not taken a bottle of Coca-Cola or even a pet drink in the last three years and they find it amazing. But this is a step towards um, getting 
healthy and um, living a longer life. Next slide. So healthy eating is primarily a predominantly whole food, plant-based diet, which consists of um, legumes, grains, tubers, vegetables, and fruits. I often get this question. Um, people feel that lifestyle medicine um, prescribes a vegetarian diet. But I'm very quick to tell everyone that no, it's not primarily a vegetarian diet, even though we are putting an emphasis on a plant-based diet. But that means whatever is grown from the ground, um, whatever you cultivate in your farmland, um, it could be beans, it could be rice, it could be yam, it could be sweet potatoes, all the different types of vegetables and fruits. But what makes the difference is that when you process these meals, when you process these foods, then you get a lot of harmful products. And that's what makes the difference. That's what leads to um, people developing these lifestyle related diseases, also known as chronic non communicable diseases like hypertension, um, high cholesterol levels, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. So, the basic thing um, with our foods when they are processed is that they lead to inflammation. So, we, we are prescribing a minimally pro processed food for our patients. Um, we want to make sure that the food uh, are less of canned foods or less of packaged foods, but you take it straight from the ground to your kitchen and um, you cook it and eat it. That means you need to have less of um, food from eateries. You have to get less of food from, um, from places where you don't have a control over what they are cooking. Avoiding free sugars or added sugars is very important. Um, when food is processed, that's when you get the free or added sugars, which I highlighted in that um, diagram where you saw a lot of sweets. Minimal dairy is part of what um, we also um, encourage in lifestyle medicine, which includes the different types of meats, um, poultry and eggs. But even when talking about meats, processed meats are even um, far more um, dangerous. Um, and when you're talking about processed meats, we mean things like um, sausages, bacon, jerky, ham, hot dogs. They are known as the number one group for um, um, causing carcinogens within people such that they are predisposed to colon cancer, stomach cancer, pan pancreatic cancers, as well as um, prostate cancers. Um, Less of saturated and trans fat is also part of healthy eating. The fried meats also contain um, those carcinogens, and then they have high saturated fat, which can block the um, blood vessels. We have oils, butter, lard, fries, industrially baked goods, all are the things that we, we give a negative prescription for. Portion control is also important. So you might be eating the right things, but how much of it are you taking? Even our, our fruits should be taken in portions. Um, one medium size of fruits, um, you could have up to five of that in a day, but spread out and just one at a time. So a palm size of um, your fruits or a medium size, just um, like my fist. And then food timing is also important. Um, we emphasize meals. And that meals be taken before um, 7 p.m. so that the body has enough time to digest. And there are some hormones that are also released at night that are supposed to help in the metabolic processing and digestion and repair in the body. And this favors um, um, weight loss. But for people who tend to eat late, they tend to um, develop insulin resistance and um, overweight, obesity, and then type 2 diabetes. Mindful eating is also important, and that means getting off your devices when you're eating so that you can um, attain satisfaction from your food. And the cues, you'll be able to recognize the hunger cues within your system, and you, you have less cravings for more food. Next slide. So what are the benefits of a plant-based diet? Um, number one, it reduces inflammation. 
because it's high in antioxidants and several um, multivitamins, it reduces the risk of hypertension. Um, it, it reduces the risk of diabetes. It also boosts the natural killer cells within the, the body, which um, helps to reduce um, the carcinogens within the cells. It lowers the risk of cataracts and improves lung function and also slows the rate of aging. It's important for us to know that there's something in lifestyle medicine known as epigenetics. Um, we're able to switch um, your genes, even if you had a genetic predisposition to disease because of a family trait or a family history, but you can switch that predisposition by um, taking a healthy leap in your lifestyle and that would reduce mortality. Next slide. So these are a few key studies that um, talk about the evidence um, behind um, lifestyle medicine. I mentioned the lifestyle heart um, trial by Onish et al, in which there was cardiac um, regression um, in people who had coronary um, heart disease. So there was a regression in the rates of the um, stenosis, the cardiac stenosis, just because they applied this basic lifestyle intervention, which has to do with dietary change. We also have a, a study that was done by Nola et al, um, which looked at the reduction in the incidence of type two diabetes with a lifestyle intervention. So it's proven that we can actually treat and reverse type two diabetes with lifestyle interventions. We have the portfolio diet study by, by Jenkins et al. And this also is an important study. And in this study, what was done was that we looked at a diet that was high in plant sterols, soy protein and fibers and almonds as well. And he compared that to um, a diet of um, people in the control group and then the people who were on statins. And at the end of the day, the reduction in um, the rates of um, prostate um, cancer were much lower in those who were on um, the lifestyle intervention without a statin. We also have the, the germinal study. The germinal study had to do with the changes in prostate gene expression in men going and intervene intensive nutrition and lifestyle intervention. And um, this also showed that you could reduce the, 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 the genetic predisposition to um, prostate cancer just by making um, intentional lifestyle changes. We also had the Diet Fits RCT, that's a randomized controlled trial by Gardner et al. They looked at the effects of low fats um, versus low carbohydrate diets um, on um, 12 month weight loss in overweight and overweight adults, as well as the association with the genotype pattern on uh, insulin secretion. So these are um, scientific studies that form the baseline for the evidence that we have in prescribing um, healthy eating. So this is where I'm going to stop. Um, I bring you greetings from um, members of AFRIONE all over Africa. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much already. These are your references. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, now we have our second speaker. is Abdul Hadi in Abdul Manap. He's a lecturer in Department of Family Medicine, UPM, and uh, exercise, uh, in Exercise in Medicine Malaysia National Center, Family Medicine Specialist Association. Um, over to you, Abdul. This is to talk about being active and exercises. Thank you very much, Shankar, for that kind introduction. <clears throat> All right. Uh, hi, and good morning, good evening, and good night to everyone. Uh, okay, so my topic that has been given to me is in terms of physical activity, which is something which I'm passionate about talking about. So uh, the topic which I'm talking about is going to be uh, let's get uh, fit but spelled as F-I-T-T. -T. 
So that in actual fact is an acronym uh, for uh, what we use in terms of our exercise description, whereby it consists of uh, frequency, intensity, timing, and even type. Okay, so uh, again, so I'm from the, I'm a lecturer with the Department of Family Medicine from UPM, and I'm also affiliated with the Exercise System at the Malaysia National Center and the Family Medicine Specialist at the Malaysia. All right, next slide, please. Okay. All right, so now let's begin the definition. So what does physical activity mean? Well, physical activity is defined by any body movement generated by the contraction of skeletal muscles that raises the energy expenditure above the resting metabolic rate. So it is characterized by its modality, the frequency, the intensity, the duration, and context of practice. Now the WHO, if you can look in the slides, uh, uh, on the uh, if you look on the slide by the WHO, uh, recommends that uh, the adult aged between 18 to 65 years old be involved with aerobic physical activity of moderate intensity uh, between 150 to 300 minutes, okay, uh, per week. Whereas uh, if they are to be engaged in vigorous intensity physical activity, it is about half of that, about 75 to 150 minutes per week. The WHO, uh, WHO also recommends that uh, you do muscle strengthening exercises about two or more days per week, which must involve all the major muscle groups in the body. All right, so therefore, any individuals that do not meet the WHO recommendations of physical activity is then defined as physical inactive. All right, so physical activity can be defined as uh, those that represent the non-achievement of the physical activity guidelines. So then, there are some individuals whereby they are meeting the recommendations for the physical activity. For example, the 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or the 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity, but they can also be sedentary at the same time. So therefore, sedentary does not equate, it's not the same as being physical inactivity. Those two are two different things. So sedentary can be defined as any waking behaviors characterized by an energy expenditure of less of 1.5 mat or metabolic equivalent while in the sitting, reclining, or even lying posture. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why the need to talk about physical activity? Well, globally, 23% of adults are not meeting the recommended uh, guidelines by the WHO to be physically active. But what's more worrisome is that 81% of adolescents, you know, those between age 11 to 17 years old, are not meeting these guidelines. So in terms of physical activity, physical inactivity, sorry, the prevalence is highest among those in the high income uh, Western countries. Uh, and it's, uh, the prevalence is lower in the Southeast Asia and the Sub-Saharan Sub African countries. Okay, so, but if you look at the prevalence among the adolescents then, uh, the numbers are very worrisome. If, uh, the prevalence of inadequate physical activity can range between 18% in some countries, to even as high as 90.6%. So it has a median range of about 80%. So something closer to home, Malaysia, uh, we are seeing a reducing trend in terms of uh, the physical inactivity among our adults, whereby in 2019, about two years ago, uh, in a study done by our National Health and Mobility Survey, uh, there was a reduction to 25% from 35%. But despite this reduction, it is still worrisome as the prevalence of sedentary behavior in Malaysia is still relatively high, whereby about one in out of every four individuals are classified as being sedentary. So why could this be? You know, why could be that uh, you know the prevalence of uh, sedentary and physical activity could be so high? Well, if you look nowadays, you know people are engaging less and less in terms of uh, being physical play. They are playing more game time, uh, more screen time, and even with the recent pandemic, uh, they are uh, proceeding to online classes. So why is this a problem for in the future? It's because this can lead to an earlier presentation of comorbidities. As you know, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen, whereby we are seeing earlier and earlier presentations of diabetes, hypertension, you know, even heart disease in our patients, you know, whereby previously it'll be like in the 50 years old, but now we are seeing it in even in 30 years old. So this is worrying for us, okay? Now, uh, okay, so looking at this trend, so I, I want you guys to focus on the left, uh, upper left-hand corner. Uh, whereby uh, there's a uh, figure shown on the physical inactivity by age group according to the WHO region. So as mentioned just now, the highest prevalence of or high proportions of physical inactivity is among the high-income Western countries such as America, Eastern Mediterranean, and Europe. 
and the lower proportions are in the uh, uh, sub-Saharan African countries and Southeast Asia. But if you look at the graph, I mean, it all tells a similar story. As you age, the proportion of you being sedentary is getting higher and higher. So you tend to get, sorry, no, you, uh, you tend to get to be less physically active as you age, as you grow older. Now, if you look at the other two figures that shows here, it shows the average met or the average metabolic uh, equivalent uh, among those who are doing their, among our occupation. And you can see as the decades go by, from the 1960s to the 2010s, our average occupation mats in the top right-hand corner there is gradually declining, okay? And if you look at the bottom right-hand, left-hand corner, if you look at the physical activity energy expenditure among the U.S. mothers, it is even more so, it is, it is even more telling among those mothers who have children more than the age of five years old and less than 18 years old. They are even less physically active. All right, uh, next slide, please. So why is this a problem? Well, physical inactivity and sedentary has been very well established that it increases the risk of developing non-communicable diseases, as mentioned by Dr. Ori just now. And physical inactivity is directly responsible for the global burden of many diseases in the world. Okay, for example, like coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and even breast cancers. And in 2013, it was estimated that the global healthcare related cost attributed to physical inactivity was 53 billion. Imagine that. So physical inactivity and sedentary has also been shown to increase the risk of uh, premature mortality among patients has also been shown to have a significant dose response association between sitting time and all costs of all costs and severity mortality. So among those who report sitting almost all the time versus those who report sitting almost none of the time, those who report sitting almost all the time had a 50% higher risk of dying from all causes of uh, all causes of mortality and CVD. And tau and all noted that as a hazard ratio of 1, 1.02, and 1.05 for every one hour increase in seating between 0 to 3 hours, between 3 to 7 hours, and more than, 30 hours, and more than 7 hours of daily seating. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. Now, so we know it's worrying. Okay, we know what's the effect it can do to us but something can be done about it, all right? If you look in this figure here, it shows that the more hours spent being physically active in moderate to vigorous intensity of uh, exercise or physical activity, it helps to lower your hazard ratio for cardiovascular disease mortality. So if, and this is even more so among those who are very uh, sedentary right? or, or very uh, inactive in their daily lives. So if you look at the green lines there, okay, uh, which uh, represents those who are uh, inactive for more than eight hours per day, all right, or uh, sedentary more than eight hours per day, they develop the most benefit by being by getting more and more physically active and getting it done regularly. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now, uh, now let's talk about the differences between exercise and physical activity. So in terms of exercise, okay, exercise is a subset of physical activity, all right? So exercise consists of a plan, structured, and repetitive bodily movement. And when it is done, it is to improve and or maintain one or more components of your physical fitness, all right? So now if you take household chores, for example, you know, doing household chores, yes, it does constitute being physically active, but it is not the same as exercise, all right? Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, here what I want to show is are the components of fitness, all right, of being phys of physical fitness. Well, physical fitness can be divided uh, into two different components, the health-related physical fitness component and the skill-related physical fitness component. In terms of the skill-related physical fitness component, this is more relevant to sports-related activities or exercises, or it can be more related to improvement in your performance. But what I want to focus more on here is in terms of the health-related physical fitness component. All right, so when we are prescribing exercise, it will help to improve all these components here under the health-related uh, subtitle here, okay? It can improve your cardiorespiratory endurance. It improves your body composition, such as uh, improving your muscle mass, 
in reducing your fat mass. It can improve your muscle strength and endurance, and even helps to improve the flexibility, the range of motion available at a joint. Okay, next slide, please. So why should we advise our patients to be more physically active? Well, I mean, if you can see here, the benefits are plentiful, you know, from improving your cardiovascular and respiratory function to reducing your cardiovascular disease risk factors, such as reducing your resting blood pressure, reducing your inflammation, reducing harmful cholesterol and increasing your good cholesterol. Physical activity can also reduce your morbidity and mortality related to your coronary artery disease and even reduces or lower the incidence rates of uh, certain cancers, such as even colon and breast cancer. Being physically active is beneficial even for the elderly as it can improve their cognitive function, feelings of well-being, and it can help even helps to reduce their risk of falls and even injuries from their falls. Okay, next slide, please. So now that we know the importance of being physically active, so after knowing the why, we need to go to the how to get them started. So the how is we can start with pre-participation screening. So what does pre-participation screening do? Well, it recognizes, number one, those who require medical clearance before participating in any forms of physical activity or exercise, those requiring medically supervised exercise program, and lastly, those that need to be excluded from exercise until their health condition is stable. All right, one such form, uh, uh, one such form for pre-participation screening is the 2021 uh, Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire for Everyone. All right, it is a self-administered questionnaire and it is able to detect those that requires medical clearance. And this is uh, freely available online for everyone to use for. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, this is just to show the continuation from the 2021 FAQ. All right, and uh, was it answering to any Answering yes to any one of these questions would then require the patient to see a med uh, to see their physician to get medical clearance before engaging in certain intensities of physical activity or exercise. Okay, so next one. Well, now if you look here, the American College of Sports Medicine has also released their own flowchart for exercise pre-participation health screening. All right, and this is usually used by the exercise prescribers. So what it does is it determines the level of intensity an individual can safely exercise depending, number one, on their regularity of exercising, the presence of comorbidities such as known cardiovascular diseases, metabolic diseases or renal diseases, and the presence of signs and symptoms suggestive of those comorbidities of CV, metabolic and renal disease. From then, it will then determine whether medical clearance is needed and lastly, to what intensity can they safely exercise. Now, going to medical clearance, okay, for example, like exercise testing, it is up to the discretion of the physician uh, whether they need to proceed or not. So it's on a case-to-case -case basis. It's personalized, all right? All right, so if you can see this, uh, this picture here of two, uh, oh no, of horns logging, you know, the ACSM and the United States Guarantee Services Task Force have differing opinions whether they need to do uh, exercise testing prior to engaging in exercise or not. So again, it is up to the discussion of the doctors or whether or not and what uh, do they want to proceed in uh, for their patient. Okay, now if you look at the next slide, why all this commotion? Why all the hassle before exercising? Well, mainly it is to reduce the risk of developing sudden cardiac death during exercise you know, or acute myocardial infarction during exercise. Now, the development of sudden cardiac death or AMI during exercise, it commonly occurs during vigorous bouts of exercise and among those whom are sedentary, okay? Now, this risk reduces as an individual becomes gradually more and more active. So if you can look at the slide, as the subject, you know, the sedentary subject becomes gradually more and more active, their risk, their relative risk of developing acute myocardial infarction when engaging in vigorous exercise bouts will lessen more and more as they engage more and more in terms of their physical activity. So for low and moderate intensity of exercise, it's in generally safe for most, all right? So what you want to do with your patient is you want to start low and you want to start and go slow and gradually you want to progress them, okay? So remember, it's progression, not perfection. Now, if you look at the next slide, all right? 
now we reach to what can we do in our clinics, all right? So what can we do is we can start by asking, okay? How? We start by asking them by using the physical activity vital sign or otherwise known as the TAVS, all right? Now, the physical activity vital sign, okay, it's very short. It only consists of two questions. If you can see in the physical activity vital sign uh, picture there, question number one is, on average, how many days per week do you engage in moderate to strenuous exercise, for example, like brisk walk? And you ask me this in the amount of days, all right? And there are examples there being given for moderate intensity and vigorous intensity. And question number two is, on average, how many minutes do you engage in exercise at this level? And this is answered in minutes. And what you do is you take the question number one and you multiply it by question number two, and you will, guide, you will, you will get the minute per week. And from this, you can determine whether your patients are actually achieving the WHO recommendations of being physically active or not. All right. So why TAVS? Isn't there others? Yes, there are others, you know, for example, your GPAC, your IPAC, even your MAQ. But the thing about the PAVS is, as compared to the others, is it's very brief. Okay, the others are more for research uh, tool based and their questions are very lengthy. And the PAVS is comparable to the others. Okay, it has a high validity where it can detect up to 91% of those that do not fulfill the WHO recommendation. Okay. So why the need as a vital sign? Why the need of physical activity as a vital sign? Well, as with any vital sign, a vital sign will be able to estimate the risk of a disease, the existence of a disease, and the severity of a disease. It can also help to determine the effectiveness of a treatment and can also be used as an education tool for your patient. And that's where the PADS fulfills this criteria. Okay, the PVA, PADS will be able to detect those who are inadequately physically active, it can drive the importance of being physically active. And it's also as part of an initiative to inform that exercise is part of medicine. Exercise is medicine. Okay. All right. Now, if you look on the next table, yes, this table here, you can see the metabolic equivalence of physical activities. Now, this is just a, a table uh, that shows the common physical activities and it is classified as light, moderate, and vigorous intensity. So when in, uh, prescribing a certain physical activity or prescribing a certain exercise for your patient, you know, we can determine what exercise would be more suitable or what physical activity would be more suitable for them according to the level of uh, fitness, you know, based on the pre-participation screening just now. Okay. Now, quickly, uh, and just to recap back in terms of the exercise prescription, all right, the, uh, the WHO recommended uh, we should do at least 150 to 200 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity or exercise, or at least 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity of exercise. Not to forget that you should also do muscle strengthening on uh, that involves the majority of your muscle group uh, and should be done on two or more days of the week, all right? And uh, you should reduce your sedentary time, okay? And uh, it is also recommended to more than what is recommended Okay, that means if you do more than the 200 minutes or more than 150 minutes of exercise and physical activity, there are many other additional benefits, health benefits that can be derived from it. Well, okay, now this is coming to the exercise description. So this one I'm just going to uh, quickly run through in terms of exercise description for aerobics, physical activity or exercise. Okay, now uh, the F uh, stands for frequency. So for patients, you want to, uh, it is recommended for them to exercise more than five times per day. Okay, uh, and for the in terms of intensity, uh, for the moderate and vigorous intensity is recommended for majority of the adults, except for those who are very sedentary or very conditioned. For those, they are recommended to go for light to moderate intensity. Now, in terms of the time, uh, it is recommended between twenty to sixty minutes, uh, per day of uh getting physically active or exercise. But even for those who are sedentary and deconditioned, even up to less than 20 minutes per day, it is still very beneficial for them. Now, in terms of the type, it should be uh, regular per school, and it should involve the uh, most muscle group and should be in a continuous and rhythmic in nature. Okay. Now, uh, what's interesting is it's like, you know, uh, it is recommended, you know, putting about 20 to 60 minutes. But the thing is, it's like this can be divided. Okay. So a minimum of 10, uh, 10 minutes per session. So if let's say you want to start with your patients with 30 minutes of exercise per day and you do not have that 30 minutes straight, what you can do is you can ask them to divide it into 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So you can ask them to exercise 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes in, during different times or 15 minutes and 15 minutes depending on them. So that's the beauty of it. Okay. 
So uh, again, remember to start slow and go slow. This is in terms of progression, as this will help to reduce your burnout, soreness, injury, and days of being physically inactive, and subsequently will improve your adherence. Okay, moving on to the resistance training prescription. All right. Okay, so in terms of the frequency, uh, it should be involve all the major muscle group, and it should be trained on about two to three days per week. All right. Uh, so. In terms of the, uh, what I want to focus more on here is in terms of the uh, repetitions and in terms of the sets, okay? So in general, it should be about two to four sets, okay? And in terms of the repetitions, it depends on our objective of our patient. What is it that we want to achieve with them? Whether we want to achieve strength and power or is it muscular endurance? So let's say for the uh, general adult, if they want for, to go for strength and power, it would generally be about eight to 12 repet repetitions. But if you want to go for muscular endurance, then it'll be higher repetitions of about 15 to 25 reps. Okay. Now, moving on to the next slide. Okay. So, oh well, this one I just want to show, uh, this is uh, you know what we do over here in our clinic. Uh, so, okay, uh, this is what we do in our clinic. Uh, we have a putra Fit clinic. And uh, lastly, the next slide, please. Uh, and the next slide. Okay, that's all. So again, I would like to thank everyone uh, for your kind attention. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Abdul, for that informative presentation. And it was very, very well uh, organized and gave a lot of information. Um, now we have spoke about uh, diet, that's healthy eating already done it very well. And now Abdul talked about exercises, that is active living. Now very important thing we are going to talk about, that is reducing stress. So we have uh, our next speaker for this. That is Kela Al Othman from Saudi yes. Arabia. She is a family physician there and will be talking about reducing stress, another very important pillar of lifestyle medicine. Over to you, Hela. Yeah, greeting everyone. Hopefully that you're still enjoying our presentation and you're still waking up. Uh, my name is Hela Uthman. I'm a family physician from Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. I will talk about how to reduce our stress in our daily life. Next slide, please. And here's my objectives. I'll start by stress and the unhealthy lifestyle and describe the nature of stress and to identify most common of the stress. And then I will analyze how to screening tool to find the stress and the evaluating uh, evaluated man management options and then we will design how to do a basic action and relapse plan, uh, relapse plan. Uh, last i will define the rule how positive psychology in lifestyle next slide please so before i will begin i will just talk a little bit about small introduction worldwide how its effects in our uh, worldwide. 70% of our primary care provider visits are related to stress and lifestyle issue. At time of stress, people are less likely to do healthy habits. Uh, prolonged stress can be affect neuroendocrine balance, suppress the immune system, and also to lead obesity and other medical disease. Uh, there is a study in UK, it says that individuals who eat unhealthy diet show higher rate of stress and depression. But with a good successful treatment, it can be uh, treated. And uh, there is one study, a study include uh, 220,430 Finnish workers between the age of 19 to 62 in different uh, jobs look the effect of how extra work hours can affect them uh, for seven years follow up. They found it's increased the heart rate disease. And for women, 
it's been increased the incidence of type 2 diabetes by twofold in another study. Next slide, please. So what is the nature of our stress? The nature of our stress is, as you see in the left picture, like uh, one, he have many external events that can cause internal event that leading an alarm inside our body. So the physiological uh, response, it works with uh, what it's called sympathetic nerve system. Sympathetic nerve system, it will lead to activation and overestimulation of the flight and fight response. So what will have with time, especially if the someone he have recurrent stress over time, over uh, over the years. Sometimes it will sh shut down all the uh, response and will have maladapting coping and a breakdown of the emotion, which will affect him uh, in his daily life. Next slide. So the stress have a complex and many etiology. There is something modifiable factor things that we can control all. And the second thing, the non-modifiable uh, factors, which are as a basic genetics, anabolitical, and prenatal infection. The modifiable factors, it's by today our uh, talk is about nutrition, the environment, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, heavy alcohol use, and other medical diseases like hypertension, obesity, depression, sleep disorder, anxiety, or any other psychological problem. Next slide. So what our rule as a physician to help our uh, patient and client in our clinic? The first thing is to screen and to diagnose significant stress to make sure what is the diagnosis. The second thing is to develop an emotional wellness and action plan which is, will be clear from your side and also for the patient side. And the third thing is you need to have a team member in your clinic, a team member that will help you and help the patient for teaching them about self-management technique for relapse prevention plans. plan. Uh, this one, I will discuss it furthermore. Uh, next slide, please. So this picture says how we select our patient and how we can screen them probably. So next slide. The stress scale assessment uh, was originally uh, uh, created by physiological, uh, psychological uh, Dr. Sheldon. And the, this test, you can use it in your clinic. It's, uh, it's between 10 item questionnaires, uh, 10 item and each item have specific grades and the scoring grades. If the scoring grade between zero to 13, that means the patient he have low stress uh, threshold and he can uh, uh, control his daily life. But it, what, if it was from 14 to 26, that means he have moderate stress and he need more intervention uh, from, uh, uh, from intervention. And the third one, if it was higher, between 27 to 40, that means he have very high severe stress that uh, probably will affect and already been affect his life. Uh, next slide. So this is the first one, the first screening assessment you can do, but the second most important that you need to rule out any other underlying mood disorder. The most common, the first thing is uh, the depression disorder. Depression disorder, we usually use it at the clinic uh, with a, a screening test is the patient health questionnaire. You, we usually ask two questions. If it was positive, both of them, we will go further for the next other questionnaires, which is uh, the first question is we can ask over the past two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, and hopeless? If it was positive, ask the next question. Over the past two weeks, have you felt a little interest or pleasure in doing things? If the two questions 
are positive, you are going through the next other uh, questions like, if do you have a weight loss, gain, change in the appetite, uh, and the sleeping disorder, any psychomotor agitation, uh, fatigue, feeling worthless or excessive guilt, uh, crying, concentration deficiency, uh, recurrent, and also you need to screen about suicidal idea to make sure that uh, you don't have any safety problem. And if, um, and usually if it was five and more of the symptoms are positive, uh, usually that means we diagnose the patient that he's depression and we treat him. So the most happen stress that uh, this patient experiences is depression. Depression, usually we use it and treat it with treatment and other non-pharmacological treatment. If the patient is not have depressed and all of that negative, we will screen another assessment rule. Uh, next slide, please. The next assessment is we need to rule out any anxiety disorder. The anxiety disorder, we usually use JAD uh, assessment, which is have two questionnaires. If it was positive, we're going through the next uh, questions. So the first question is within the two weeks, how often have you felt nervous, anxious, or in the edge? If it was positive, ask the next question. In the last two weeks, how often you not been able to stop or to control worrying? If the both questions are positive, you are going through the next uh, questionnaire, uh, symptoms. Like, do you have restlessness, easily fatigue, difficulty concentration, uh, irritability, muscle tension, and any sleep disturbance? If it was positive and five and more, uh, we can end over. If it was more than half of the days have these symptoms for at least six months, that means that your patient, he have experienced an anxiety that his affect and increase his stress in his life. But if he's not have any anxiety and you and this patient not related to obsessive compulsive disorder or anorexia or uh, post-traumatic syndrome disorder, you rule out all of these symptoms and it's not related to substance abuse, you can diagnose the patient that he have underlying uh, as a chronic uh, stress, not related to psychological and not related to substance abuse and not related to other any other medical problem that make him under critical stress. Next slide, please. So how we can treat our patient in the clinic and we make sure that uh, back to their normal. Uh, most of the stress, what we will discuss here today for the uh, lifestyle is non-pharmacological method. Uh, pharmacological, uh, uh, the pharmacological or the treatment or the medication, we're not uh, getting information about it. So I will focus more about non-pharmacological. So what we have, you can see a list, big list of things that can help our patient. And also maybe you can help yourself and your beloved one to, uh, to reduce their stress in their life. Uh, like mindfulness, exercise, meditation, relaxation, and these things I will explain more in, uh, in the future. Abdominal breathing and breathing technique, how they can do it at home, and also to teach the patient how to do expressive and creative things that he loves, like movement, dancing, playing musical instrument, if he, uh, they sing very well, good. Uh, to uh, learn about art or to create art. Uh, tai Chi is very excellent exercise that can reduce the stress. Uh, Papillor therapy, which, which is the use of the book with intent to bring the medical or physical healing. That means if someone who reads, it feel comfortable or less rest. And to help yourself about self-help websites, uh, the seventh one is volunteering for meaningful causes. Uh, for me, I, I always say my, to my patient that 
volunteer for anything that you like. No need to have something purpose. That's just you feel comfortable and less stress when you are doing. Uh, a lot of the people, this, uh, most of the things also, the regular time of the nature under the sign, this is a good one of the option. Uh, but especially, please tell your patient to put sunscreen, especially under if you have a hot sun in a, as our country. And the last thing is about spiritual, uh, spiritual and religious activities. Uh, all of these can be helpful and you can mention to your patient and uh, each patient, as you will see in your clinic and depends on your society, they have totally different perspective, totally perfect, uh, the enjoying thing in their life. Next slide. And how to promote self-management technique. This thing that you need to teach yourself and your team uh, to help your patient to learn how to do and accept themselves. Uh, first, to encourage healthy coping skill. As, as, before, as I said before, the stress, one time, two time, we can tolerate it. But with the recurrent stress, sometimes your coping management in your body will not tolerate it as before. So you need to learn and teach others how to do a healthy coping skill, like learning cognitive behavioral therapy, how to do problem solving skills, how to do learning time management. Time management is very good. And also to improve one's sense of humor. Sometimes a person with the age and with a lot of stress, he will lose his sense of humor or any uh, enjoyable life to do. And also to learn how to assertive techniques. What is the priority in uh, the life? And uh, also to, to express most of the people who have very heavy stress in their life, sometimes they will respect themselves in negative perspective. So try to them to see them in the positive way, uh, to be open to other compliments, to be open to others. Uh, the first time if you see your patient, well, kind of difficult to tell them what to do and what to have. But with follow up, usually the patient become very accepting to all of what you're saying and how they can change their life. Uh, next slide. And also if they have uh, to encourage to use social support because social support is very helpful. And uh, also you need to know and define the gaps if the, it was not addressed by their social network that the physician or the clinic that can be helpful. Um, digital media support, it's amazing now. Everything is online, the apps, the video, the uh, group, social groups, WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, etc. It's amazing how our society, especially with these things can be very helpful. Uh, and especially also you need to teach their patient how to co cognitive reconstructing to see from different angle. Uh, next, uh, no, the before slides. Like uh, if the patient, he have uh, a look at an event from an angle, you can tell them there is an other angle that you can look from that situation and not helpful and to remind him not to be helpful to focus in one event that cannot be changed and to be focused in the mood. Uh, can you uh, put the previous slide, please? Uh, this is a slide that shows how the tips to support a relationship in uh, between you and your uh, patient. You need to acknowledge and reflect patient view of self-care and the quality of life because the quality of life of the patient is totally different from your perspective. So you need to have acknowledge and reflect what his view. Respect the patient autonomy, support him whether you are with him or not. You need to uh, support it because this is the only found uh, the patient will come. If he will not feel that you respect him, the, his anatomy and his views, he will not come back. 
and also to promote patient self-efficacy. Uh, but the most problem that you need to protect everything and not related to other safety concern and it's not most important not affect other. Uh, this is the most tips that can be very helpful in your clinic. Uh, next slide. So you need to what now? Uh, no, no. Yes, the action plan. How do an action plan? The previous slide, please. So previous, the action plan. How to do an action plan? You collaborate with the patient and the family if there is social support or someone he trusts to develop a written plan. This is the most important, that the plan must be written. And the next, uh, the next follow up to review an action plan during the visit and emphasizing the writing plan down and also to put it in the patient file. So for the, uh, the other follow-up, you will check the chart and you'll see what happened, what's, uh, what is the progress of the patient. And also it will help you to work as a team for any progression. And always tell the patient the monitoring progress is a great thing. And you need to tell the patient the relapse, it will happen, reassure the patient uh, this is not the end of the life, uh, everything going well. Uh, maybe the first time it will not succeed, but the second and the third, mostly yes. The next slide. So I about this, uh, how to do or create an action plan that is very specific to the patient. Uh, so you, can, you have a clear idea of what I said before. So the first thing to put a specific plan, which emotional challenge that will be focused in which lifestyle that change the patient wants, what is the commitment, the timeline and the follow up and who's the support team that who will use this and who will see the patient. Like uh, there is an example, it says, my first activity to cope with an uh, emotional challenge any emotional channel that the patient uh, experience and to improve the emotion is begin with exercise, any exercise that can be beneficial, like um, writing down uh, cognitive behavior, any assignment, uh, and you need to do it in a timeline specific, like one time, three times, or two times per week, for and you need to have a commitment of timing like 20 minutes one hour half an hour be very specified with a patient because more specified the better the outcome for you and for your patient and also you need to make sure that you have a support system like now my husband will walk with me and keep me accountable and we'll follow up in two weeks by phone or by the visit in the clinic about how it's going and how the progress it happened. I hopefully this is uh, clear to do how to do an action plan. The next slide, please. So the before it, you tell the patient bye bye, you need to have a relapse prevention plan. As I said, that's. Relapse, it happens with everyone, it's no problem. Uh, just give them uh, challenges time, uh, help the patient plan for challenges at the time, work or family emergency. It's like a speculation of what will happen just in case of what happened in emergency, what he will do, he or she will do. And to decide ahead what time to say and what, to, how, what happened to do to stay in the track and also to encourage him uh, to reach to his family or friends or the trusted person, at least to talk with a stressful life or unsuccessful life event. And uh, most importantly, the more you are shared with people in the group, social networks, um, uh, better, uh, better outcome. And also you can learn from other techniques or maybe sometimes you are overestimating something and it was uh, not imaginable. Uh, so the plan after you finish, you just give the patient follow up and you'll see what will happen in the future. Next slide. 
Yes. There's two definitions that I need to talk to you before I finish. Something called is positive psychology. The, posi uh, the positive psychology, it's part of a study, like a strength of virtuous that enable the individual and the community to thrive. What that mean? That means that it's to reduce the happiness, but not lessen the misery. That means you need to experience the commitment. You need to have experience with the past and to be having and staying in the present and also to hope for the future. And what that in conclusion is that the individual need to focus in the strength, to have the integrity, the curiosity, it's not specifically like a treatment, but rather it's a lifestyle. Uh, this is how it happened, like uh, counting your blessing, expression, appreciation for other, even for the small things or the enjoying time, it happens daily time. And also if, if uh, some of the people, they like to write. So if they write, write will help them to appreciate things. This is very excellent and uh, trying to practice kindness. Sometimes people will hear these things, they feel uncomfortable, but with the practice, everything will be easy and also your perspective for your life, it will be very, uh, very better. Can I have the next slide, please? The, uh, another definition is the mindfulness. The mindfulness is it's a way in facing a situation, alternative by beginning fully present. That create a potential for each moment to be experienced as it is. That means that you pre uh, practice a relationship between your mind and your body and help to create the awareness. Create the awareness uh, of the space between the stimulus, the stress, and your response of the situation. That means you be uh, that uh, be here in that moment in that current stress, which allow you to think more, to have a freedom and distant from that stress. Uh, and it's not focusing or starving or to get something else or to be in somewhere else. It's like just a teaching method for your daily life to be mindful and to be focused on the event itself and to let your emotions outside and protective and not make yourself misery more. This is what it means, mindfulness. And the next slide. Uh, the next slide. It's okay, next slide, please. Uh, the healthy time perspective, as before I talk about a little, a little bit before, that in the past, Tristan and Babat remind him time to time, forgiveness is good, satisfaction, how they can reach to this uh, behavior or this thinking. It's very pumpy road, but it can be achievable. Just reminded, you're not the first and you're not the last. I know that you have a critical time in your past, but you are now here. You need to be thinking for your future and to have savoring the moment and to build uh, for your future. And just remember that positive emotion increase life satisfaction and this life satisfaction increase um, the will uh, being resilience, building the resilience and also to increase the well being. Next slide. So, this is a website that uh, idea about the positive ratio.com is an, to check how's your positive to negative emotion uh, ratio and it's measure how you release uh, resilience to your life's life daily light it's very helpful uh, to see are you flexible in your life or it's very difficult to overcome the obstacles it usually have a lot of questions you can submit it through this website and they will show you how much uh, you are uh, struggling or you are can overcome the obstacles 
uh, you can try it after the course. It's very interesting and very nice. And you can use it by yourself or your others or even in your clinic to try it at uh, free time. So the next slide. The next slide is the last slide about, I bought two website, two mindful-based stress reduction programs. Both of them very good. One of them uh, stress and mindfulness and how to think and how to do re reduce stress to, your, to you and your patient. Uh, both uh, the programs usually have nine classes over eight weeks usually have uh, a lot of lectures uh, online, practicing, participation. It's very beneficial if you are planning to open your clinic for uh, lifestyle stress management. Uh, you can check it later and hopefully that you had uh, very uh, beneficial. Next slide. In the end, stay curious, please. This is your life. Don't be judgmental for anyone, Get an open-minded for a great life. Hopefully you are enjoying your uh, my presentation and uh, have a stressed life less. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any question, just put it in Q&A. And um, so I will be very happy to answer any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hela, for that comprehensive presentation with uh, many resources as well. Um, as we are running short of time, we'll just move to the next uh, speaker. Yeah, we have Marina Jotik Ivanovic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, she's thank a family you. physician. And uh, Marina, over to you. Straight up, you can start. Uh, thank you, Sandha. Uh, I see we do not have much time for, for the presentation, so we can start. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit of history. We all know that the uh, tobacco came to Europe uh, from the New World after uh, Christopher Columbus discovered it. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, and uh, you, as you can see, the first farm was in Santo Domingo in 1531, and the first tobacco vending machine was created in 1610. Next, please. Uh, before we need to know and ask ourselves why people uh, actually smoke. Uh, there are many reasons like addiction, everyone does it, social activity, after a meal, stress relief, when having coffee or tea, emotional support, uh, uh, bonding and acceptance. Next, please. Also, we have to distinguish two things, what is nicotine dependence and what is tobacco use. Tobacco use includes the intake of tobacco smoke from cigarettes, cigars, pipes, and hooks, either by the individual smoking or oral absorption of the nicotine. And cigarette smoking is the most common form. Other tobacco products include water pipe, tobacco, various smokeless tobacco products, cigarettes, etc. Uh, we also know that tobacco consists of more than uh, 4,000 uh, very harmful su substances, and one of them is nicotine, and nicotine is the one to blame for the uh, dependence and uh, for that, nicotine uh, dependence occurs when you need the nicotine and you cannot stop using it, using it. Next slide, please. Uh, nicotine acts as a nicotine cholinergic receptor, triggering the release of neurotransmitters that produce uh, psychoactive effects that are rewarding. Next, please. Uh, as you can see, ICD-10 classification classifies nicotine de uh, dependence in mental and behavioral disorders due to 
uh, psychoactive substance use. Next, please. Uh, so tobacco in numbers, uh, if we can see uh, the VHO uh, report, we see that 8 million deaths are caused by tobacco every year, and 1 million deaths is due to secondhand smoke exposure. Despite uh, of deaths, also tobacco threatens uh, the poverty, and uh, around 226 million people globally are uh, poor. Uh, because they use tobacco. And in, in low-income countries, sometimes more than 10% of household income spend on tobacco. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also, this is a chart for uh, VHO where we can see the prevalence of tobacco smoking uh, among persons aged 15 years and older. It is a report from 2015. As we can see, the prevalence is uh, higher in the part of Russia, in the part of uh, South America, also in Asian countries. But there are some countries like uh, most countries in, uh, in Africa that is uh, very low. Next, please. Uh, tobacco uh, and smoking affects uh, most uh, of the organs and it is related to various cancers, ha heart attack and heart disease, stroke, COPD, uh, and also uh, miscarriages, premature births, atherosclerosis, and high blood pressure. Next, please. So what is our goal? Our goal is uh, to help our patients to quit using tobacco or to quit smoking. Uh, we have to persuade them that they can quit smoking and to show them steps and to give them support during this period. Uh, next, please. What are the actual health benefits of smoking cessation? Uh, there are uh, long-term and uh, immediate benefits. Uh, immediate benefit is that within 20 minutes, your heart rate and blood pressure will drop. But if we look in the long-term health benefits, we see that after five years, your stroke risk will reduce to that of a non-smoker. Uh, 10 years after, your risk of lung cancer falls to about half that of a smoker and your risk of cancers of uh, mouth, throat, esophagus, bladder, cervix, and pancreas also decreases. And 15 years after quit smoking, the risk uh, from uh, heart and coronary disease is like uh, the non-smokers. Next one. Uh, next, please, so we can move. Uh, all adults uh, should be screened routinely for tobacco use, and all smokers should be encouraged to quit at every clinical contact. Also, motivational intervention should be used with patients who are not yet ready to quit smoking. Next one, please. Uh, motivational advising, we usually use 5 R strategy of motivating patient. Uh, components are relevance. Uh, we encourage the patients to identify reasons to stop smoking that are personally relevant. Uh, risk, uh, advise the patient of the harmful effects of continued smoking, both for the patient and for the others. Uh, rewards, ask the patient to identify the benefits of smoking cessation. Roadblocks, explore what barriers to cessation that the patient may encounter. And repeat, include aspects of the five hours in each clinical contact with unmotivated smokers. Next. Uh, what uh, we should never do, lecturing, confronting patient and threatening him. Next. Uh, this slide, uh, this picture I saw in one webinar uh, that was uh, uh, in collaboration of Elmo and 
ENSP and tobacco and e-cigarettes consumption through lifestyle interventions. There is a link I put uh, that you can see. And uh, here it clearly states that there are three uh, things uh, involved in the process. It is a patient, it is an expert, and it is a coach. The question is, who is the patient and who is the expert and who is the coach? The patient is always the expert of his own life in the office and how he implements the treatment. And the doctor, ourselves, we are the coaches. We have to understand the patient, his needs, uh, his view on the situation, and we have to show empathy. We have to accept uh, their uh, wishes, uh, their ideas, and we have to accept their personal choices. Next one, please. Uh, also, we need to know where is our patient today. And for that, we use the trans-theoretical model of change that is Prohaska de Clement model. That is consisted of uh, four phases, phase of pre-contemplation, phase of contemplation, phase of preparation, of action, and of maintenance. In every of these phases, we have to have a motivational uh, intervention. In the phase of pre-contemplation, our patient isn't ready to quit smoking. And here we devote like three to five minutes just to um, give uh, the patient some basic uh, advices about, uh, the, about uh, that he should quit smoking, but the decision we leave to the patient. In the contemplation phase, uh, in this phase, uh, the person uh, thinks of quitting the smoking and it is ideal uh, to discuss what are the benefits of quitting and what are uh, the, the disadvantages of smoking. But also uh, in this phase, the patient is left with the decision. In the phase of preparation, uh, here the smoker has decided that he will quit smoking. So in this phase, uh, the consultation that we give must be the longest. And usually it lasts 20 to 30 minutes. And in this phase, we advise uh, the patient about some specific information about uh, the possible obstacles that he might find during the phase of cessation about withdrawal syndrome, about uh, changes of behavior, etc. And it is the best that uh, the patient in this phase declares the exact uh, time and date when he will quit the smoking. Uh, uh, it is the best uh, that uh, that happens in the next two to four weeks. And it is advised that a day before that date, the patient gets rid of anything that might, um, uh, might uh, uh, look and uh, drive him uh, to smoke. Uh, he should uh, throw out all the cigarettes, uh, the lighters, uh, everything. And also, also he needs to, uh, tell his family, his friends, his co-workers about the decision that he wants to quit smoking and to find some member of uh, the family or a friend who will be the person to support him. It is ideal that in this phase, we get uh, uh, ma uh, we give um, consultations uh, like two to six consultations, minimal two. In the phase of action, the patient has stopped smoking and uh, we here consult and arrange a follow-up by the patient needs. Also, it is very important to stay in the phase of maintenance. Uh, and in this phase, we should congratulate the patient and we should support him to stay like that. 
but in every of these phases, uh, the relapses may occur. If the relapse occurs, uh, we should not uh, judge the patient. We should not confront him. Uh, we uh, need to, uh, along with the patient, to describe what were the motives, uh, what were the circumstances of that relapse, and to identify them and to encourage our patient to continue in the process of smoking secession. Next slide, please. Also, there is a 5A counseling strategy uh, that is used by American guideline, uh, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. Uh, and it is uh, been uh, developed to allow physicians to incorporate smoking cessation counseling into busy clinical practices. Like uh, ask, you ask the patient if he smokes and you enter this data in his electronic chart. Advise, you advise him uh, that he should uh, stop smoking. Assess, you uh, assess the motivation of that smoker if he is willing to quit or not, and you will get the motivation interview. Assist, you will help him make a plan for this decision and arrange a follow-up. You will follow the uh, smoker in the shorter period that uh, you have to. Next one. Uh, this is, uh, next one, please. Uh, challenges that we might face on this road uh, are uh, many. Uh, for the patient, it is the time after awak awakening, stress situation, urge for smoke, friends and families and relatives that smoke. Uh, next one, please. Uh, challenges for us as health pro professionals may be weak positioning of health promotion and disease prevention activities in national public health, strong lobbying from tobacco and alcohol industry, lack of time during regular visits, that is the uh, most common challenge, a lack of training for smoking and alcohol cessation activities. Although we have the guidelines, we have all we need, but we need to know how to implement them in practice. Next one, please. Also, we have to give other healthy advices like uh, that person should start eat uh, healthy and regularly. We have talked about this during this webinar. Uh, also physical activity, uh, also uh, choose water first and other beverage, etc. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, VHO has created uh, an online platform uh, for help uh, quitting tobacco use, and it's called Meet Florence. She can help you quit tobacco. Uh, there is also a link to this uh, platform. Next one, please. But what uh, we need to worry and what our new goals should be is how to prevent young people, kids, to go in this circle of tobacco use. Uh, this new goal is also a goal of tobacco industry and they target the young ones, uh, but we need to find ways to help the young ones not to go in that trap and we have to let the secret out. Next one. Uh, what are the ways that tobacco industry is target, uh, use it to target new generations? By direct advertising, by indirect advertising, by promotion of tobacco products at popular events for young people. Uh, they do sponsorship like major sporting events and teams that include their logos. Also they sponsor like concerts and uh, some other events, and also they make uh, like uh, flavors for, uh, for uh, new tobacco products. Next slide, please. Uh, what is the key strategy and measures that we need to take? Uh, we have to say that secondhand smoke also kills. 
uh, we have to do pictorial health warnings. Uh, we have to ban on tobacco advertising. We have to raise the taxes on tobacco and we need to help people quit tobacco. Next one, please. Uh, one of the responses came from WHO. It is six empower measures to monitor tobacco use and prevention policies to protect people from tobacco use, offer help to quit tobacco use, warn about the dangers of tobacco, enforce bans on tobacco advertising and promotion and sponsorship. Next one, please. And as we can see, tobacco concerns us all, individuals, families, communities, states. So we all need to uh, act in one, uh, with one aim, with one goal, to quit tobacco and uh, tobacco use. Thank you all for listening. I want to thank uh, Wonka Young Doctors Movement. I want to thank um, Spice Root, everyone. And also I want to thank VDGM for choosing me. And I want to thank my colleague, Ozdan Gogdemir, and she helped me with this presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Marina. That, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I um, would invite a few questions. We've overshot our time by um, a few minutes. So if anyone has any question, can you please um, Unmute your mic and then share. Any question? Um, we've also provided the opportunity for you to enter your questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, some of the questions have been responded to. Um, so we'll just give ourselves a few Seconds, if anyone has any question, you can raise your hand or you unmute and then ask your question. Uh, resource persons are available to respond. Right, um, there was one question in the Q&A box. Um, I think that was to Ore about which kind of oil is considered healthy oil. Ray, can you respond? Um, is there any oil, any kind of oil that we consider as healthy oil? Um, thank you, Kwame. Yes, yeah, so I, I tried to respond to that in the Q&A. Um, what happens is that many of the oils that we have, they, they become bad when we take them, when we heat them to certain temperatures. So we could use a bit of oil. It's recommended that we have um, some bit of oil you know, in, in our food and that oil could come from canola oil. It could come from olive oil. It could come from peanut oil, um, sesame oil. Those are some good seeds. But um, when we heat them to a certain temperature, then we begin to get some dangerous products that can be harmful to us. Right, thank you very much. I've, I've read the comments in the chat box and everyone is very happy with this webinar. Um, comments such as, this is very insightful, it's been educative, and I, I can't agree less. So at this juncture, I'd want to thank my co-chair, Sanka of Spice Root, with whom everyone has organized this webinar. Um, I'm, we are grateful to Harris at Wonka Secretariat for putting together the Zoom platform for all of us to join. Particularly, I want to thank Loretta and Brando for the excellent interpretation. And they've been busy all afternoon. Thank you so much for the excellent work. Now to our panelists, um, Ore from Nigeria, we are grateful. Abdul, thank you. Thank you, Hela, thank you, Marina. And Austin has also been in the background. I also want to thank all of you um, from Raja Kumar, from Vasco da Gama, from Spice Root, all over, everyone. Um, you've all joined this session to make it 
successful. When I checked, you had over 100 participants, and that's quite impressive. So let's all go back and stay healthy. Let's help our clients to live healthy lives. We hope that the lessons we've learned today will apply to ourselves and also apply to our patients. Thank you all very much, and have a great day. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you. Bye.